This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The information presented on this program is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult an appropriate professional for guidance about your concerns. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. Good morning. It's Deep South Dining. It is Monday morning and good morning, Carol. How are you? Good morning, Mel. How are you doing? We're steady talking about tomato fillets, and we've just sort of gotten off. You know, off. we just get off into to <laughs> something. I mean, until you sent me something, yeah. uh, sent me a text, I'd never heard of a tomato fillet. Neither had I. So I guess we should go ahead and tell our listeners what a tomato fillet is, Carol. Well, it can since, since I brought it up. Since Malcolm brought it up, he read an article about the difference in marinara sauce right. and tomato sauce. And if you wanted to give your marinara sauce, which is a thinner sauce, right. more texture to add tomato fillets. Mm-hmm. And what a tomato fillet is, is the inside skin of the it's it's that thick outer shell of the tomato when you Mm -hmm. remove the seeds and the pulp and all the good stuff in there it's like that wall correct of the tomato tomato wall yes and you can find that wall also in stewed tomatoes cans. in cans of yes. stewed, stewed tomatoes or if you put tomatoes up fresh every year yes and, you and can add your fillets you can have the big chunky and now fillets. we have this word that we're going, going to be using and just finding ways to use and and there are other differences between tomato sauce and marinara one i i believe if i'm i'm correct about this is that tomato sauce is cooked slower and longer versus marinara which is made uh, quicker, and uh, it's, as you say, it's th- more thin. Yes, and marinara is not usually the razzle-dazzle. I mean, it's not a thing in itself. It usually gets combined with with, with, with something. It's and one, yeah, 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 yeah. Pasta. Is this what goes, which, which one would you say goes on a pizza? That's a pizza sauce. Tomato sauce. Okay. The thicker, You need a, a, a thicker, but tomato sauce is made with, you know, the Holy Trinity, I mean, you're doing your garlic and onion and, and celery mm-hmm. and, and right. you know, cooking it, you know, cooking it down. It's just uh, a thicker sauce. Yeah. So if you have thoughts about marinara versus tomato sauce, we would love to hear from you. Send us an email to food at mpbonline.org. Otherwise, that sounds good to me. That'll be a wrap. <laughs> now, uh, in our intro, I introduced our guest incorrectly. I'm, I mispronounced her name. Of course, it's Katie, not Kathy. And if we know Katie, Katie is yes. is famous. Katie, she Simmons is the famous catfish person. Crosser of Yazoo. Indeed. Yes. Indeed. So, sorry about that. You know, Monday Katie. mornings, Katie, Kathy. The, the good thing is she is such a kind person that she is going to forgive you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I need forgiveness. All I can get. Now, What's cooking, Mal? Well, in our kitchen this weekend, uh, uh, my lovely wife made a fabulous strawberry custard pie. The, the crust she made was with Meyer lemon cookies and butter <gasps> crunched and processed into a a crust she's shaped into a uh, spring pan, I guess what you call it. Spring form. Spring form. And then made this uh, custard using lots of egg whites, uh, egg yolks. 
and and uh, condensed milk. One of my favorite condiments. I love <laughs> condensed milk. Never yeah. thought of condensed milk as a condiment. It we'll is put to it me. on the list. You know, I used to keep it in the, a can of it in the refrigerator as a child or as a young person. And I would take it out and just stick a spoon in it, and it was a, like a treat. It was like a yeah. walking around lollipop type thing. Anyway, so Kara made this wonderful strawberry custard, I guess you'd call it a tart or a pie, and it was just outrageous. I'm thinking about it right now. Yes, I'm sorry you didn't. Didn't bring it. You didn't. <laughs> yes, of course. Probably because Java's not, not with us today. Well, I thought about bringing it. And I didn't. Yeah, so well, there's I thought, that. Well, how much am I willing to give up? I mean, that really is what it comes down to. <laughs> it, 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 it comes down to that. Well, I thought if I brought you a piece, then I'd need to bring Kevin Farrell a piece, the cookie. Uh, and then Katie, you had you would have to have a piece for Katie. Katie. And then there would be none yeah, left. Yeah, right. And so okay. I had to think through that. Get her to make two yeah, next, next time. time and job is away today and and so kevin farrell is uh running the controls here and he is also that, that like when the cat's away the wait. mice will play well, are you feeling frisky <laughs> <laughs> and kevin of course is the cookie meister yes and today he made blueberry kevin. crunch blueberry is that crunch. right okay good very good kevin makes cookies every monday morning he does well um, um in my kitchen no sweet has been going on. It's been all savory, and I'm continuing my trip through Vish Bot's book, I Am From Here. You've been posting like a mad person on well, cooking and coping. you know. Dish after dish after vish after <laughs> dish. I, well, I've, I've had vish dish number one, number two, and number three, and what my goal was or is is every week – for the next few weeks to try a dish out of the cookbook. Mm -hmm. And I am in love with the book. It, you know, it's all the flavors of the world in a Southern style and in an approachable way. But this week I made Trinidad pork pilau. And, you know, he brought up the associ association, the long association between the American South and the Caribbean. And, you know, in the Caribbean, People came together from all over, well, whether it was you know, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Africans, the Chinese. Everybody bought a little, brought a little something to the pot. Right. And this was a delicious pork pilau with, with brown rice. And it's not exactly what I would call a summer dish. It was uh, absolutely delicious. Very hearty. And then when Katie comes on, I will discuss my catfish parmesan that is also from the book now we intend to have vish on the show we've had him on before but yeah. it was during covid as right I recall. right we, that's not that a period that we remember fondly we just no. may do we love it when our guests come here to mpb world headquarters sit in the studio with us and we salivate together as yes, we, we talk do. about food uh, i saw on cooking and coping yesterday somebody was listening to vish as they were posting on Splendid Table, oh, the great PBS show that Francis Lamb hosts that the comes mothership. on on Sunday morning. It's the our mothership. mothership. Right. So, you know, I'm so happy for his success. Now, the book is entitled... I Am From Here. And, and Vish, uh, he has an operation in Oxford... Snack bar. The snack bar, for those of you who wonder what we're talking about. But I think the title about. of the book comes from the fact that yeah, Vish is an Indian man. Mm -hmm. And people ask him, where are you, where from? Are you from? And he's <laughs> been here for over 30 years. Right. So uh, he's, you know, he says, I am from here. Well, we look forward to you continuing to cook Vish dishes and post them on Cooking and Coping. Yes. And Speaking sharing. of yes. Cooking and Coping, did you see that slow or shallow poached salmon by Paul Brown in the Delta? I did not, but please tell me what well, I missed. I don't know. I must I have immediately, been, been busy with a birthday party. Okay. Da dashed the, off a text to him. And? <laughs> but, and he had... Uh, he took a piece of salmon, and instead of deep poaching it, mm -hmm. he did a shallow poach. And he first he put the salmon in a skillet and, you know, seared it on the top. Mm -hmm. Then he took the fish and put it in a very shallow. It looked to me like a 
a cake pan. It probably was bigger, the picture. But, you know, it's a pan with like a one and a half inch right. lip. And he put a seasoned butter in the bottom mm. Mm. and poached it and then took the seasoned poaching liquid and put it over rice. It absolutely sounded delicious oh. to me. Fish rice. Yes, it became a fish, fish rice. A fish rice, but... Uh, but but the poaching liquid went halfway up the fillets, not fillets, but fillets these are, are tomatoes. Are tomatoes. Fillets these are, are fish. these are fillets. But it was a, a beautiful dish, and I communicated with Paul Brown. I, I, I said, "I've got to do this. Tell me how." And after a few more texts, fi- find out that he is from Greenwood and teaches with Leanne at the Viking Cooking School. Small world. It is a small world. And Katie. Taught Katie taught at the at Viking, the Viking cooking, cooking School. school. She was the kitchen manager. The kitchen manager. Yes. So uh, today is my grandson, Wilder Malcolm Webb's third birthday. So I want to wish him a happy birthday. I'm sure he's listening at Little Sam Daycare. I'm sure they have a song, <laughs> Carol. I'm, I'm quite certain of that. Well, we had a delightful party for him yesterday. And uh, so anyway, I want to wish the little rascal happy birthday. Now. <laughs> We, I have found an article on the Internet that talks about the essential culinary terms, 40 essential recipe terms that you should know, written by Katie Duckworth, I believe is her name. Anyway, so we mentioned that we were going to take all 40 of these for the next 40 episodes of Deep South Dining and just touch on each one. Last week, we began... By discussing, and they're alphabetical, by the way. Yes, and you're going to have to repeat all of them in order I hope not. at the end. Okay, at the end, yes. So al dente is where we started last week, just to recap. Al dente is an Italian term that means to the tooth. Mm-hmm. So when your pasta recipe calls for al dente pasta, you do not want to be soft and mushy. You want your pasta to be a little bit to the tooth when you bite down on the piece of pasta mm-hmm. there's a little give gotcha so today's term baste basting is a technique where you spoon or brush liquid fat over meat during the cooking process this helps maintain a juicy tender piece of meat to baste remove the meat from the oven and pour the drippings from the bottom of the pan over the top of the meat. You can use special basting tools, such as a brush or a bulb, but you can also get the same effect with a spoon. This technique works great to achieve a fried egg with crispy Well, and I was going to mention that. I, I didn't know that was at the end, but you know, basting a fried egg, you know, just tilting the skillet and scooping up some of the liquid and pouring it over the top, is the best way to fry an egg. Absolutely. All right, so that's your culinary term uh, for today, and we are glad that you are here. Carol, August is National Catfish Month. But you know what? In nope. Mississippi, every month is Catfish Month. Every day is Catfish Day. It is. All indeed. roads lead to, to catfish. catfish. Especially at Hal and Mal's, I'm coming today to have a catfish po' boy. We have a catfish po' boy. We also have a catfish dinner. And then on Friday, we always have catfish day. Catfish day with hush puppies, coleslaw, french fries, and a fabulous Simmons filet of catfish. And we also serve, as I was telling our guest, the fried catfish and also the grilled catfish Taco, taco and that's have good. That have become our number one seller. You're kidding. No. I was so pleased because y'all brought that on during COVID. We did. When you, I, I guess you tweaked your menu. And I've had it many times. I hadn't had the had it fried, but I love that dish. Excellent. Katie's so. smiling, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Please introduce our guest, Carol. <laughs> Katie, welcome to Deep South Dining. This is Katie Simmons Prosser. She grew up in the catfish business. Her father, Harry Simmons, got into catfish. He switched from farming in 1977, and the rest is history. Uh, today, Katie serves as marketing and branding manager, but yeah, I just 
think of her as the queen of catfish because she's everywhere. Every restaurant knows her. Uh, I don't know how she gets around as much much as she does, but she is a great ambassador, not only for Simmons catfish, but for American farm-raised catfish. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're glad you're here. We had you on once before, but it's been a while, so welcome back. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. So what is going on? What are the latest trends uh, in the catfish world. Uh, I, I know we're always fighting the domestic uh, imported issue. Um, and I guess as I know you've got to be fighting labor issues in terms of your, your own operation. Because if you own a business in 2022, labor is the thing, right? Right. Yeah. And that's where it's starting to be more positive. The labor issues um, are all our employees are coming back, and I think it's production is picking up, so it's on the upswing right now. So ben, the pandemic um, really took away your biggest market, which were the restaurants, right? Right, yeah. It took away, about, I guess, about 40% of our business is restaurants. Mm. So, but the good part about that is that the retail business picked up during COVID, so that kind of helped ease the, when the restaurants weren't going strong. A lot of people were cooking at home who, right. prior to the pandemic, really weren't. They were eating out more. Well, I know I personally fried a lot more catfish. Yeah. And, and right before COVID, um, our catfish was in Kroger. So that kind of helped. A lot of people could find it and were able to mm -hmm. cook it at home. And also our web store, the sales picked up. It was crazy how many people were ordering catfish just from all over. Wow. Wow. So talk a little bit about the, the farm operation. Uh, I know that your father switched over from cotton and soybeans at some point and decided to get into the, to the catfish business. Uh, how did that change in terms of the landscape of the farm? Well, he was looking for a way to kind of diversify his crops, and catfish was kind of new in the 70s, so he got into that. He still does the um, cotton and soybeans and corn on the side, um, but he just needed something to kind of fill in the time when if he had any bad crops, and there's a lot of downtime in farming. So he started doing the farm, and um, he started realizing he was having a hard time finding a place to sell his fish to get processed. So in 82, he opened our processing plant. Um, it just kind of started out real small, hoping just to process, process a little catfish, and it's grown. And um, we've been in business 40 years now. My goodness. Yeah. That's quite a success right. for a small Mississippi uh, business. Well, and let's talk about the challenges of farm-raised catfish versus the imports that are coming in and how you deal with that as a catfish farmer and business owner. Well, a few years ago, they changed it so catfish is um, inspected by USDA. So we have a USDA inspector in our plant every single day. So they, they, they inspect the imports as well. So and that's, that's really a good helped. thing, and that was a real problem before. Right, exactly. Um, and every catfish has to be labeled where it's from. So you can look and see if, where your catfish is from, and restaurants are retailers. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Now, you, you're you in the business, the family business. Have you always been in it, or did you pursue another career? I think you went to culinary school, did you not? I did. I got a marketing degree from Ole Miss, and then went to culinary school in New York um, and worked um, for a food magazine and for a cooking school and catering. Um, and I started working at Simmons Catfish about 10 years ago. My dad was looking for someone that could do marketing, and I said, well, <laughs> I have culinary degree and a marketing degree, and I know this product better than anyone. <laughs> else so kind of was a good fit so I've been there about 10 years and you say that it's a family business and there are other members of the family who are also involved right right my husband he came in about seven years ago and he's operations manager he kind of does a little bit of everything from connecting the farm and the plant and any problems that arise Andy's called on to that and then my my dad is still there working as well and also my cousin is our farm manager Wow. So is it true that somewhere near 80% of the catfish consumed in the United States is either from China or Vietnam? Is that right? I don't think so. I think that's probably an old statistic. An old one. What, what yeah. percent would you say it is um, that's not domestic? That's not domestic. Maybe about 40, 40 to 50%. Oh, okay. yeah. That's great. That's yeah. great inroads have been made. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. I feel like um, demand is really up for U.S. catfish right now. And why should our consumers our listeners consume American catfish, and in this case, Mississippi catfish, as opposed to 
and ports? Well, of course, to support your local economy. Um, but our catfish is raised pretty strict standards. Um, and you, the standards of the imported catfish, no one really knows how it's being raised. It's not really uh, monitored like our catfish is. And um, I feel like that's just a, a big thing for people to look for U.S. catfish. I was on a culinary trip to Vietnam about 12 years ago working for Viking Range, and I know you too worked for Viking Range at one time. And I was really surprised. I, I, we actually saw a catfish farm. It was not, you know, an official visit, but there were big nets on giant poles in the Mekong River where they were, you know, trapping the catfish. And it was not a real appetizing thought of what else was in that river. Right. Doesn't look very sanitary how yeah, they're so doing I, it. <laughs> I really got, got a message about U.S. farm-raised catfish. Right, exactly. And I feel like U.S. catfish it has a better flavor, too. You can tell that all the care and detail that's taken put into it. Okay. Back in the Viking days, too, I remember working with uh, Simmons Catfish and some of the other catfish people on a new product you know, for restaurants, and we had fun. It was a thicker fillet, and everybody had a lot of fun coming up with names and landed on Delicata, and we were the test market in Greenwood at Gardena's Restaurant uh -huh. for Delicata. So tell our listeners about Delicata, and I see you can now buy it, buy it not just in restaurants. Right, yeah, you can order it on our web store or in Kroger. Um, several farmers markets like Freshway and Cockerels have it as well. But it's the center cut of a fillet, and we hand trim it, removing that skin, fatty skin layer that's on a normal fillet. So it's just a fresh, thin cut, or well, thick cut. But um, it's perfect for sauteing, baking, anything like that. I say don't fry because it's too, too pretty of a piece to fry. <laughs> <laughs> we call it the fillet mignon of catfish. Of catfish. <laughs> and you sell that to a lot of restaurants. We do. Um, Bravo has had it on their menu for a long time. They do like a New Orleans style with polenta and um, kind of a corn and corn velouté they put on top. Mm. It's really good. And Crazy Cat has it as well. They have a really good delicata dish. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Hey, what about this thin fried phenomenon that sort of started with Middendorf's down in Louisiana? Do you, do you process a thin fried uh, fillet? We do um, kind of a, it's called a catfish chip cut. And we cut the fillet in parallel, so they're little slivers. Um, and right now, Kate in Ridgeland is doing a Jackson hot catfish using the catfish chips. Yes, I've had that. It's, it's really good. That tasty. is a delicious dish. It is. In fact, I think, Malcolm, we have a recipe. Well, it's Nashville hot catfish. We do? Yeah. I oh, think okay. we came up with this a couple of years ago. I think we should share it with our listeners. Okay. Well, we'll put it on the website. And, and we'll about. also talk about Jackson hot catfish, which is hot, hot, hot. And it is. I think it's one of the best dish, dishes on Kate's menu. Well, they go through about 60 pounds a week, which is a lot of catfish chips. Mm. <laughs> it's a lot of That's fish. a lot of catfish chips. A lot of chips. chips. It is. And they serve it with that sauce that kind of, so it's not too spicy once you dip it in the good sauce. Yeah. Well, now, how do people know when they go to the grocery store that they're buying American uh, catfish? It's labeled, and that that's a law that... I guess came in effect years ago where you, it has to be labeled country of origin, where it's from. Mm, okay. And restaurants as well have to have it labeled. Gotcha. Well, I know that, that the Mississippi catfish farmers and catfish institutes were real instrumental in getting that, that law passed in Congress. They were, yeah. That was a big deal. And they worked hard on that, getting, and also in getting the USDA inspection as well. Where does Mississippi rank of state uh, state-wise uh, as a producer of American catfish? I'm pr it's the top producer of catfish. I think Mississippi produces about 50% of all the catfish. My goodness. Arkansas is a big producer. Arkansas and Alabama. And uh, I see um, our friend Marcy Ferris weighed in last night. I mentioned that Katie was going to be on the show about North Carolina catfish. So it looks like they're trying to, they're developing an industry. They there are. As they're well. doing a great job. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really eager to talk about my catfish dish from the weekend. Okay. I'm trying to find it here. Well, while you look for it, I have one more question for Katie. Okay. 
about this. What do Simmons catfish eat? I know they're pond raised, so they must have a very strict diet. They do. We, we feed them. Um, it's a high protein food pellet that's made to float on top of the water. And so they learn to eat on top of the water rather than bottom feeder like a wild catfish. So that's where you get the clean flavor from. So they're trained uh, to eat differently. Right, exactly. Because a typical catfish, known as a bottom feeder, works the bottom of the lake, the bottom of the river. Right. But these these fish are trained from an early, I start to say early age. <laughs> <laughs> they are, yeah. What, what are small fish called? Fingerlings. They, fingerlings. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so these young fingerlings learn to uh, feed from the top of the water. Right, exactly. And so we feed during the warmer months, we feed them every day. Every day? Every At day. At a certain time of day? Um, really in the morning, really just whenever. Right now, um, during the summer months, the oxygen gets really high and low, so they have to kind of manage to keep it kind of where it's average. Mm. Wow. Do you ha- have a, a, a system for your fingerlings, or do you buy them from... Well, we have um, a partner that has a hatchery, and okay, that's where okay. they hatch the, the eggs. And is that also in Mississippi? It is. It's also in Yazoo City. So how old do the fingerlings have to be before they're considered fish and ready to be harvested? Um, I'm not sure. A few months old, because it only takes about 15 to 18 months to grow a a catfish. Really? Yeah, we usually harvest them when they're about one to two pounds. Oh, my goodness. So it's a lot smaller than you think. The the fillet fish, you let them get larger? Is that how you get the larger fillet, or is it you you take it all from that size fish? Well, it just depends. They're all different sizes coming in, but usually it's one to two pounds. Okay. Deep South Dining, Malcolm White, Carol Palmer, and Katie Simmons Prosser of Simmons Simmons Catfish Catfish in Yazoo City. Yeah, Zoo City. We're glad you've joined us today. Remember that we are live today, but on Sundays at 9 a.m., we are rebroadcast, and you can really access our show anytime through a podcast. And uh, all you have to do is go to the MPB website and look or up. Or your favorite podcast web, uh, provider. Apple Podcasts, all Spotify. Of the above. Right, right, right. So, uh, Catfish, it's not just for the deep fryer anymore, Carol. It once upon a time was considered uh, a fish fry item, but it has evolved. It has evolved indeed, and and that's something I'm really interested in talking to Katie about. But knowing that she was coming on the show, I was, you know, trying to think of a catfish dish to try. I'm married to someone who loves the fried catfish, and... I've got a lot of deep frying going on at, <laughs> at, at my house, and he, I had already promised him catfish this week. So, uh-huh. and I looked through Vish's new book. I am from here. He has a whole chapter on catfish. There you go. There's some very he has kung pao catfish. Kung pao. Kung pao, just like at a Chinese restaurant. Mm. You could have kung pao chicken or kung pao catfish, but I landed on catfish parmesan. <gasps> And it was delicious. And uh, Italian catfish. Well, and Vish said he loves chicken, veal, and eggplant parmesan. And he was in the Mississippi Delta eating with some of his Delta Italian friends. And he starts thinking, catfish parmesan. Mm. And it was it, the preparation it is really the same. I mean, you take your fillets. And you dust them. Well, first you put egg wash, and then you dust them with breadcrumbs, Parmesan cheese, lots and lots of spices. And you pan fry them just in about maybe not even an inch of oil. And then add your tomato sauce and your provolone cheese and bake it for six or seven minutes. Now, this is a marinara sauce or a tomato sauce? It is a tomato sauce. Uh And I did not have a homemade, a good tomato sauce on hand. I had a can of tomato sauce Mm. in my pantry, and I jazzed it up a little bit, you know, adding some herbs and use that. But next time, I'm going to put a lot more energy into my tomato sauce. But it was absolutely delicious. And how did Johnny take to the catfish? Johnny took to the catfish. He really, he really did. He just could not believe that 
you know, he was having something so fine. It's not your father's catfish. It is not your father's catfish, and I did not serve coleslaw, <laughs> coleslaw or hush puppies with it. But, Katie, I, I really recommend you try this recipe and look look through this book to see. You know, I, I know you sell to to fish and to snack bar. Right. He's always changing his menu, too, and he thinks of very inventive ways. Always puts kind of an Indian twist on it, too. So it's very unique, the mm-hmm. way he does the catfish. Yeah, and one of the ones I'm really interested in trying is catfish and spicy coconut sauce. I think that that sounds absolutely delicious. Yeah, sounds terrific. Now, Katie, you were telling us about the Catfish Trail, a new uh phenomenon is it uh, statewide or is it national well it's mostly in the south um and actually snack bars on the catfish trail okay. um, and the catfish institute which is the marketing part of the catfish industry started the catfish trail um, and you can go to uscatfish.com to see all the different restaurants and they're just really trying to highlight all the restaurants in the south um, and each processor puts up different customers to be on it but they just go and interview the restaurant show the history of the restaurant and their catfish dish and there's all kinds of catfish houses but there's also people like the snack bar um and different places like that that are doing different things i love a good catfish house like a a big old sort of side of the road small sort of off the beaten trail fish house like there's Jerry's well, there's millions catfish. of them. <laughs> there are millions. There are millions there of them. Highway 49 yeah. has a plethora There's of two as you enter Hattiesburg. There's, yeah. there's one on each side of 49. Is um, that Max on the river? Yes. Max is on yeah. the left, and on the right is, uh, I bet you somebody listening knows the name of that. My, my brother Hal loved that little restaurant. It's on the right before you get to Max. But anyway, I can't think of the name of it right now. I know there's uh, Quavis Fish Houses in Purvis. Love Quavis. Yeah, that's a, lot a good of, one. That's a good one. A lot of yeah. people out of New Orleans come up for... And Taylor Grocery. Mighty yeah, fine. Yeah, that's a great one. Mighty fine. Mighty fine. So much good catfish. So the trail is being developed by the Institute, you showed? Right, by the Catfish Institute, mm-hmm. yes. And it's a kind of a marketing, branding... Right. It's a they um the Catfish Institute started a best I guess about in the nineties and it's the marketing arm of the catfish industry and it's funded by the feed mills. So all the processors fund the Catfish Institute just to kind of promote the industry as a whole. Well tell our listeners what a feed mill is and how it well, relates to Well a feed mill is catfish. where you get your catfish feed from. Mm-hmm. So they're they're co ops, so each processor has is in a co op with other processors for their feed mill. How many processors are there in Mississippi, would you say? In Mississippi, I think there's probably four. Four. Yeah. There's not many big processors left. I think in all, maybe seven. What became? At one time, it seems like there were a dozen or more. Right. I think around... I guess it was in around 2008, some places started closing and catfish farmers started getting out of the business. So it's a lot hmm. smaller than it used to be. But, you know, we were we have the farm and the plant, so we are able to do both sides of it. We, we have the farm and part of the feed mill and the plant, and we distribute all our catfish, catfish so we're a little different than everybody else. Hmm. Well, Carol, what's your favorite uh, catfish side? I know you, you and I love condiments. We love sides. We do. Uh, actually, it's your brother's coleslaw. My brother's coleslaw, yes. <laughs> Hal. Hal, my brother. May well, he rest in peace, indeed. and may we eat his soups and coleslaw Can, forever. For the rest of our lives. So I'm going to ask you, tell us about Hal's coleslaw. I had some at Hal and Mail's <laughs> last week, but this is, this is my thing. Well, the thing I always like about coleslaw are, are the multiple colors of peppers. I mean, of course it's cabbage, you know, sliced very thin with onions and capers are very important to our version. But also I like to thin slice uh, green, yellow, uh, and orange or whatever color bell peppers you can get your hands on so that it gives it this beautiful look. So you've got the white cabbage, you've got the... Uh, the dill weed, which is another important uh, seasoning that we use. And, of course, mayonnaise, which is, mm-hmm. you know, Hellman's. <laughs> it, of course it is. Ma- Malcolm and I have a Duke's Hellman Uh-oh. relationship. <laughs> What's your favorite mayonnaise? I think I'm a Duke's girl. Good. <laughs> Great, Katie. I'm but, a Yankee when it comes to mayonnaise. But, Malcolm... I, I actually ate at Helen Mel's last Monday uh-huh. and had the coleslaw, 
And it just reminded me, I think we talked about it then. I was with Peyton Prosper, who always loves a good, oh. a good, a good meal. You just don't find people making their own coleslaw that much anymore. Yeah. And it really was an important part of the plate. It is. It's fresh. It's got a nice zesty uh, freshness to it. Like I say, we've just, co- we've just chopped all of these vegetables. Onion. We use red onions, white cabbage, white green cabbage, these beautiful colored peppers, these capers, this dill weed. Squeeze a little lemon in there sometimes. I usually add it to mine right before I eat it. I squeeze lemon on it. Just my own thing. Well, in honor You've of... You've got the recipe. I know there. it. I do. And, and I'm going to ask Java to post this so so those who are hearing about Malcolm's coleslaw <laughs> can do it. What about you, Katie? What are your sides for fried catfish? I really love something like cheese grits or collard greens, something like that. We mm-hmm. had a really good dish um, at a Southern Foodways event. Nick Wallace made thin fried catfish with cheese grits and it was one of those memorable meals you always think about when you think of a a good catfish meal. I had cheese grits at the University of Mississippi yesterday. There was an event uh, to put up a historical marker for Dr. David Sansing on campus and there was a brunch prior to for friends and family and I attended it and they served a brunch item that was it was cheese grits with bacon and shrimp all in sort of a casserole. But it was delightful, just delightful. And it's hard to, you know, serve 40, 50, 50 60 people at one time. Sa- that like sounds that. delicious. Really good. Um, it, but, Katie, you're, you're, you know, some people just think of hush puppies and coleslaw as sides for fried catfish. And the thought of grits is wonderful. And you mentioned greens and another d- d- dish in vicious book <laughs> is collard wrapped catfish oh, wow. so that kind of goes to what you're saying those two flavors right really yeah. play like a grape it. leaf wrap thing yeah it, or it's, lettuce wrap? it looks like a, a lettuce wrap oh beautiful and it's wilted yeah yeah so we have to check that out i've never had that who makes the best hush puppies <clears throat> on the planet you no 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 we make good ones but golly i don't know i like mine spongy and that's a hard thing to achieve. Um, have either of you seen this new Arby's commercial where they talk about the hush puppy breaded fish fillet? Have Have either of you seen this? It's no, it's their uh-huh. new. It's kind of a new dish. Kevin, have you seen this? And I believe it's um, the voice for Arby's is. Uh, the great Mississippian Darth Vader. What's what, uh, James Earl Jones? James Earl Jones. I believe <laughs> Darth Vader. <laughs> it didn't he do his voice? Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I, I, I tried for 15 years to get James Earl Jones to come to Mississippi and receive the Governor's Arts Award. He never would. But what a voice, huh? But he does. He he voiceovers this ad for this fish fillet, and he says something about it being um, very southern. Uh, we'll have to get it and play it. Um, I think it's hilarious. But anyway, so you, uh, Katie, you you prefer greens and uh, what was the other one? Cheese grits. Cheese grits, yes. And Carol, your coleslaw. Yeah, I'm a coleslaw person, and I would really like to perfect a hush puppy. Do you have any tips for me, Katie? Well, we sell hush puppies, so I feel like I never really make my own because I'm always buying ours. You, you sell <laughs> you them in the grocery store? We do, yeah. We have regular and jalapeno, which if you've never had the jalapeno, that's really good. So all you do is add what? You just put them in the fryer. They're already frozen? They're frozen, yeah. Already made? Already made, yeah. And you can put them in the oven or the fryer. Malcolm, who I didn't knew? know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> so I really never make hush puppies. I mean, they're wow. so good, yeah. Simmons hush puppies. Right. What mm-hmm. other items do you sell like that that are in the store? Well, we sell breading. Um, which our breading has kind of a a lemon flavor to it. So I feel like it's pretty unique. Um, We also have, of course, the delicata and all different size fillets. And we also have fillet bites, fillet portions, (laughs) all different kinds of sizes. And these are in in regular grocery stores. Right, uh uh-huh. And we have a list of retailers on our website. On your website. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Malcolm, I've got to look around. What kind of breading do you use, Carol? Well, I've got two or three that mm-hmm. I really like. The one I'm using now is called is Andes. I Andes. think it, it's a boutique 
brand I, I buy it at Kroger in the fish section. It's is not it, with the other uh-huh. other products, but I really like that a lot. Is it uh, fish fry, which is corn flour, or is it a corn meal, or both, or do you know? It is a mixture of corn meal and corn flour. Yeah. Katie, you know this fish fry product, right? It's a corn flour. It's right. a very thin, mm-hmm. very uh, well ground flour, but out of cornmeal, I guess. But do you do you all use that in your mix? What do y'all Ours use? Ours is mix? Uh, corn flour and cornmeal as well. Both. Mm-hmm. And we just li- you know lightly dredge it in the uh, breading. We don't put it in anything before. You know, a lot of people do like a thicker batter or something, or an egg, like an right. egg batter. Yeah, we don't. Do, we just lightly coat it in the breading. Mm-hmm. I was going to share with y'all a catfish dish that I once had. The great Lillian McMurray, uh, who ran Trumpet Records on Fair Street in Jackson, once shared with me a catfish recipe that I have used and have loved all these years. And what you do is you create a kubion, like you're going to boil shrimp or crabs or crawfish. with the, You can use this seasoning you know, that comes in the bag, or you can use the liquid seasoning, or you can just... You're talking about crab boil or crab shrimp boil. boil. Yeah. Making a kubion okay. to, to boil the yep. seafood. And you cut your uh, catfish into strips, is the way she described it. And you slowly lower them into the kubion and poach them until they are cooked. And you don't leave them in there long. And then you bring them out, you let them cool... Then you serve them with cocktail sauce. It's a wonderful. That sounds wonderful delicious. Dish. That does sound good. I love people who share hush puppy insight because I'm always looking. Uh, t- Again, my thing is spongy. Are yours spongy, Katie? Do you like? I guess they're more kind of a cornbread texture with like uh-huh. real crispy outer edges and mm-hmm. stuff. That's how ours are. Yeah. But I I really like it when they're soft and. Uh, uh, I call it spongy. I don't know, Carol. What about you? You got a favorite? I'm I'm a spongy person too, mm-hmm. but I, I'm really interested in learning some new new tips. My, you know, I put like little pieces of corn and oh, you put and, the whole yeah, co- corn kernel in it, corn kernels and and red and green peppers and I th- I think I need some help. Well, we do jalapenos also. We we chop some jalapenos in ours okay. and onion. Yeah. And I don't know what else you put in yours, but. Well, I feel like if we're getting fancy, we'll do a Mexican cornbread to serve with the catfish. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's always a hit. So what what's new in the catfish world besides the the trail? Are are y'all doing any sort of new products? Are you do you have a cookbook? I mean, like, what what's happening uh, out there? Well, you know, this month is National Catfish Month, and um, they're just. I feel like the Catfish Institute is just promoting all the different people involved in the catfish industries, from chefs to retailers to the farmers to the processors. Um, also, on their website, they have a Catfish is Life videos, and you can mm-hmm. go and learn about different catfish farmers in the area. So they're just really trying mm-hmm. to get that knowledge out to everyone. Um, and at, at Simmons Catfish, we're celebrating 40 years um, in wow. business. So congratulations! Um, we've been around a long time, so we've been celebrating that and. Um, Really, I feel like right now the demand is high for catfish, so things are going good in the industry if we can just get production back and get our labor force built back up. Yeah. Well, as a trained chef, do you have time to work on new recipes? I do sometimes. Um, My kids are both very picky eaters, so I kind of have to make sure it's not too spicy. Um, But last night I made a catfish parmesan. Uh, Miss Sybil's catfish, um, Miss Sybil Aramp from Indianola, has a catfish dish that Craig Claiborne posted in the New York Times in the 80s. And Mm. we've been making the dish forever, but it's kind of the same thing you were talking about. But you pour butter, but you bake it. You pour butter on top and almonds. Um, and that's really our, my go-to as well. So you use the the uh, catfish fillet, and you you sauté it, or you put it in raw in the you baking put dish. It, well, you put it in the, uh, an egg mixture, and then the Parmesan flour and seasoning, and then you put it in the oven with melted butter on top and almonds. Mm-hmm. And how long do you cook that? About thirty minutes or so. And do you use the delicata? Is that what you call it? You can. Uh-huh. You can. Um, I use three to five fillets, but you can use the delicata. Okay. Well, we've got John from uh, Hazelhurst. John, how are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys? We are well. We're great. I can't wait to hear awesome. a hush puppy tip. Now, 
Well, listen, so I, I tuned in late. I'm assuming this is Katie Simmons with yes. y'all today. Uh-huh. Yeah, Katie, this is John Huntington. I'm Jim Miller's partner. Okay, um, yes. How are you doing? Before. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm so, good. So, so Jim's mother, Joe Miller, was great running buddies with um with Maisel Simmons. With my grandmother, uh, yes. Grandmother. Yeah, yeah. So... But what um, Joe was a fantastic cook, and uh, she she loves him as catfish. What what she did with her hush puppies was she would add in um, like half a can of cream corn into the regular hush puppy. Cream thing. corn. And it was fantastic. They were so light and fluffy, you could just eat them as quick as you could. Wow. So. That's all I got, but it's a, it's a, it's I highly recommend it. But hearing that y'all sell hush puppies, um, uh, I'm definitely gonna try that. Yes, you need to try the jalapeno ones. <laughs> so, so get a box of of Simmons hush puppy mix and add a half a can of cream corn. Would that be? Well, they're already in, uh, already formed up into little balls. Oh, so that's right. Be hard I keep to add forgetting. Something. I'm the one that can add the cream corn because yeah. I'm making the batter. And as I told y'all a few minutes ago, I've been putting corn kernels in it but that may be just the trick i need the With cream the corn. cream yeah well john thanks so it much is. man what else is oh. happening what what else you cooking down that way um well i'm just um i'm just sweating right now <laughs> <laughs> that's about that's about it yeah. so, uh, but um but i'm hungry so um so anyway uh uh, y'all have a good day okay Talk thanks later. a million uh, for for listening sure. and uh, certainly for calling in and sharing your hush puppy tip, which is to add, I think he said a half can of yeah. cream corn into your mix. <clears throat> I like it. What do you do with the other half can, I wonder? Another side dish, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> put, put, put it in a plastic container and put it in the refrigerator? I forgot to ask him what he does with the I, other you half. You know, speaking of John just saying that he's sweating today, mm. really on my mind are all our farmer friends who are starting the harvest. And there was a post this morning on Facebook from our friend Stafford Sheridan and Drew yeah. that they were starting the harvest. And you know it's hot and hot, wet. Yeah, I hope the Delta, I think the Delta has been spared as much of the rain as we have. Well, as, as I drove have. to and from Oxford uh, yesterday, I, I noticed that we sort of are unique with all the water. That doesn't seem that the rest of the state uh, has gotten it, though a friend of mine in Gulfport was telling me there's flooding in certain neighborhoods in Gulfport. So it maybe it's Jackson South. I don't know. Yeah. I, yep. I'm not really a weather prophet. But for all our farmer friends out there, howdy and hope you have a good crop. <laughs> Absolutely, because if they don't have a good crop, we suffer. Right, right, Katie. <laughs> so, Katie, do y'all co-market with any other? Like, I'm thinking about the Mississippi rice industry. Do you do anything with them or develop recipes together? I think the Catfish Institute has before um, with different rice producers. Um, and we did a, um, a promotion with the rice farm in Louisville. Um, Two Twi Brooks? Two Brooks, yes. And their, their rice is great with catfish. Mm, and they have mm. the, um, I think it's like a, a rice grits. or They do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's great with catfish. Wow, I, I didn't think about that. But that's two great Mississippi Delta products right there, right. side by side. I bet Leanne knows all about this. <laughs> well, it's about that time again. Ladies, thank you so much, uh, Katie, for joining us. And thank Carol, you. as you know, Deep South Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio. And we are funded by generous contributions from listeners just like yourself. And we thank you. Our show is produced primarily by Java Chapman today. Uh, is an exception for my co-host carol palmer our guest katie prosser simmons or simmons prosser actually i'm malcolm white and join us every monday for deep south dining and we appreciate you being here that's it for our show today always stay tuned to mpb think radio this is an mpb think radio podcast to hear previous shows visit mpbonline.org or download the mpb public radio app to listen on your iphone or android phone on demand